Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Chris Proctor. I'm an analyst with the USDA Road Development Telecommunication Program. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Richard Anderson, who will be discussing the second window of the FY 2020 Distance Learning and Telemedicine Program, or DLT program, as we call it. Uh, the purpose of this webinar will be to inform participants about the changes in the program from the first window, review major eligibility and regulatory requirements of the program, and provide guidance on how to submit a successful grant application. Um, folks can feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. Uh, we will wait until the very end of the presentation to take those questions. Uh, we've got 90 minutes today. The first 60 to 75 will be presentation, and the last 15 to 20 will take all your questions. Uh, you'll see you have a Q&A box in the bottom left corner of your screen. That is where you'll submit all of your questions. Uh, also, if you're having any sort of technical issues, you can submit those into the box, and we'll do our best to troubleshoot with you. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Richard to walk us through our presentation uh, today. Over to you, Richard. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and good afternoon or good morning to everyone who has joined us for this webinar, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, this is the third webinar for the Distance Learning and Telemedicine Grant Program this calendar year and fiscal year. That's a little unusual for us. Usually two would be our maximum, but this has been an unusual year. Uh, we are now in the second application window for the DLT program. And uh, as we moved through the 60-day the application window, which we'll now refer to as window one, that started February 10th and ended April 10th, we had a growing number of emails and calls from educational and medical folks who wanted to apply for the program but due to other demands on their time and other concerns with the, the current pandemic situation, were concerned that they wouldn't have enough time to devote to the application. In response to that, on the 3rd of April, uh, there was a press release put out by the Deputy Undersecretary for Rural Development, Betty Brand, announcing that we would have a second application window to accommodate those who, because of COVID-19 concerns, were not able to apply during the first application period. And then on the 14th of April, which was the day the application period opened, there was a stakeholder announcement also put out by Deputy Undersecretary Brand that announced that the, the window was opening, that it would be open for 90 days until the 13th of July, and that the funds available would include some CARES Act funding up to $25 million that was included for the distance learning telemedicine program in that legislation. So here we are in that second application window. For those of you who participated in or had the chance to view the recording of the webinar from March the 3rd, which has been posted on the website for a while, much of the slides and much of the presentation will be familiar, but it won't be identical. As Chris said in his introduction, we'll be going over some of the differences and highlighting a few issues uh, that you want to bear in mind as you go through window two. But for those uh, who have not had an opportunity to participate in a DLT webinar before, I assure you we'll go through plenty of information to help you understand the program a little better and put together the best possible application. So just to lay out a roadmap for this presentation, we're going to start with a brief overview of some of the basics of the DLT grant program. Then we will talk some about the eligibility, uh, the important category of matching, which often uh, is an area where there are some questions. We're going to talk about scoring, which is particularly important, and I'll emphasize that as we go through. Some of the uh, ins and outs of applying and a few particular reminders related to applying and then some information on where you can turn for assistance. Before I continue on, one thing I do want to mention is you've already heard from Chris Proctor who introduced the, the webinar this afternoon. Also at times, particularly when we get into questions, you may hear from uh, my colleagues and my boss, Sean Arner, as well as Scott Steiner who are both in the Loan Origination and Approval Division and will help with fielding the questions that you might raise during this session. 
Since this is the distance learning and telemedicine grant program, two of the most important terms that people want us to define for them are what do we mean by distance learning and telemedicine? Now, I should emphasize that whenever we talk about this program, uh, we have a couple of key sources of information. This program has a regulation. It's 7 CFR 1734. And if you go to 1734, that's where you'll find definitive definitions as well as other information. We have an application guide and a funding opportunity announcement on our website, which we hope that you will use heavily as you prepare an application. But if there's ever a question about certain defined terms or certain allowable costs, the regulation trumps the application guide and the funding opportunity announcement. So distance learning means the real-time interactive delivery of curriculum via telecommunication. Those of you who saw the presentation before might note that before I was using the word synchronous rather than real-time, but I would emphasize that real-time, the uh, interaction between teachers at one side and students at the other side over a telecommunications link is really the key element for distance learning. Uh, the word synchronous is perfectly sound, but sometimes when uh, we use the word synchronous, people are thinking about data rates. Because typically if you're buying broadband service, you get a faster speed download than your upload speed. So you might buy 25, 3, 25 megabit per second download, 3 megabit per second up. You might buy 110 upload. There are synchronous packages where you might get 100 megabit per second both directions or a gigabit per second both directions. But when we were talking about synchronous in this context, we didn't want people to get confused with the, the data speed. What we're talking about is that uh, people are able to interact with one another across that telecommunications link as if they were in the same place. So uh, this way rural residents are able to take ben uh, benefit from educational opportunities teachers, instructors that they couldn't otherwise interact with in that same way. What we're not talking about is something where uh, a wonderful lecture is available to be viewed by someone when that person has the time. That sort of thing is, is ubiquitous in the internet and it's, it's a great resource, but that's not what we mean by distance learning. We want that, that real-time interactive uh, communication between teachers and students. So similarly, when we go to telemedicine, we're talking about a real-time interactive telecommunications link that allows a patient or a care receiver on one side to receive the care from a doctor or other medical professional at the other side. And depending on the nature of the care, this may be uh, mostly uh, a camera and microphone type situation, but there also can be sophisticated equipment that is being used to monitor or even provide treatment to a patient that is controlled by a medical professional some great distance away. Again, using telecommunications to bridge the limitations of distance to give enhanced medical services uh, the ability to be addressed and delivered to rural residents uh, in those rural areas where they live. Now, we want to spend some time talking about the funds that are available for this program. And I, I apologize for how small some of the information is on this slide, but there's a lot of information to try to share. So we have the information on fiscal 2019 as well as fiscal 2020, the funds that are available and the funds that have been awarded thus far. For window number one for fiscal 2020, we have $71.7 million available. That money is broken into three different buckets. The biggest bucket is just all eligible DLT projects, 50.3 million. But there are certain funds that are earmarked for certain purposes. We have $12 million that are earmarked for projects that help address the opioid epidemic. There's 9.4 million that is targeted towards projects that address, address substance use disorder, which can include opioid treatment, but also could be dealing with other types of substances besides opioids. That was the money available for window one. For window two, we know for certain that regardless of how much of that money from window one gets awarded to applicants for window one, we will have the money that came from the CARES Act 
which uh, totals over to $24.25 million directly available to make new grants, as well as we note any carryover from window one. Uh, and the agency also noted in the funding opportunity announcement that they reserve the right, if some additional funds become available, that they could also use those for the applicants who come in for this application window that ends July 13th. When we looked at last year, we had uh, less money available, but we also had uh, quite a few fewer applications. So as I had mentioned at the outset, we, we formerly had the, the bold statement uh, mentioned here uh, uh, that was in yellow if you look at the older version of this slide from a webinar back in March. And we were noting that every eligible application for fiscal 19 for the DLT program received a grant. Well, just to give you a little bit of context, we had $71.7 million available for window one. We received 274 applications totaling $155.3 million. Now, not every one of those applications will be eligible. And there were some duplicates where somebody pushed in an application, realized a form had been forgotten, pushed it in a second time. So that inflates the numbers a little bit. But even after we remove the duplicates and we remove those that are ineligible, it seems very likely that the number of eligible applications will exceed the $71.7 million we had available, which means the scoring really is going to be important in determining who is going to get funded. When we look at window two, uh, we have uh, a lot of time for people to work on applications. But we'll emphasize time and again, the scoring is really going to matter. The score it has to be something you pay attention to. Minimum grant amount, the same, 50000 Maximum grant amount, $1 million. The matching requirement for almost everybody remains at 15%. The one, but there are a few other key changes that we want to emphasize. First of all, for this window to all applications must be submitted through grants.gov electronically. Virtually all of the applications that we got, that 274 that I mentioned a moment ago, came in through grants.gov. Very few came in on paper, which was reasonable, and we were emphasizing that to anyone who was working on an application as we got towards the end, because there were a lot of disruptions in the normal delivery protocol. For that reason, we are only going to accept the electronic applications through grants.gov for this second application window. Another change is the rurality scoring. The rurality scoring has been modified to reflect a statutory change that includes as an urbanized area, or rather defines as non-rural, an area that is contiguous and adjacent to a city or town with a population greater than 50,000. We have provided a, a tool on our website to help with determining whether or not your location or a location of an end user site is rural or not rural. I'll talk more about that and give you that link before the presentation is over. And lastly, we did include an extra item in the executive summary related to COVID-19. So let's talk a little bit about applicant eligibility. Probably a third of the questions that come in to the DLT info at USDA.gov mailbox are asking questions about eligibility. There are a lot of different types of entities that are eligible for this program. Incorporated organizations, Indian tribes, tribal organizations, state, local units of government at all levels of government underneath the federal. Consortiums are eligible and other legal entities, including private corporations, for-profit, not-for-profit. You don't have to be not-for-profit. I get a lot of people sending in emails saying, well, I am a you know, 501c3. That, that's fine. That's, that's good. But it isn't required. For-profit entities are eligible to apply. Frankly, almost every entity type, except for individuals and partnerships, and remember, individuals does include sole proprietorships, almost every other entity is eligible. State universities, state colleges, community colleges. I, I received a number of emails from, from state universities, state affiliated universities. We're going to consider virtually all of them under that category of state or local unit of government. 
that doesn't just mean the municipal government or the county government or the parish government, depending on your state. It refers to any such affiliated entity. Now, the consortium is often kind of a, um, a point of some question. So what do we mean by a consortium? It's defined formally in the regulation. Here's the definition of it here. It's a group of entities that come together for the purposes of, of the project for which a grant is requested. There are sometimes formal arrangements between the entities, and sometimes it's much more informal. If they do it formally, if the group comes together formally, that usually is a pretty straightforward process for interacting with the whole grant application process. Some sort of a document is drawn up. The entity has a separate legal existence, which is filed with an appropriate state or other government. And then that entity, the consortium by name, applies for the award, gets legal documents if an award is offered, and goes through the process much as any other standalone entity would. In the creation of that formal consortium, all the roles and responsibilities of the parties to the consortium were already ironed out. Well, then there's the informal consortium. And this also goes in a couple of different ways. So this is a group that gets together and calls themselves the DLT Grant Consortium, and they're coming together, let's say, for educational purposes. We've certainly seen that a group of schools come together and they want to come in for a grant. Well, the, sometimes what happens is one of the entities in the example I gave, one of the schools becomes the first among equals. We might refer to them as the host organization. And that school, ABC school, sends in the application. And yet it's very clear from the write-up that they, this is a, an informal consortium, but they're going to represent the group. And the end user sites are in multiple different schools. That's perfectly fine. All that has to happen because this one entity has agreed to be the host organization is ABC school applies, provides all the documents and certifications. If an award is made, we make the award, we send an agreement to ABC school, and then all of the other schools get the equipment as laid out in the scope of work in the grant application, and there's no problem with that. The time it gets a little more confusing is when no entity wants to step forward and be the first among equals. And I should mention, in that host organization scenario, the equipment is all going to be owned by the host organization. Legally, that's the entity that owns it. In the formal consortium, the formal consortium owns it. Because any grantee who gets an award from us in accordance with the terms of the grant agreement, is expected to own and control and be responsible for the equipment that's being funded by the grant. So if all the entities, let's say schools, want to own the equipment in their own right, then really the only way to accomplish that is each individual entity must contract with the agency individually. Now, there's going to be one grant agreement, but with a great many signatories. It also means when it's time to apply, all the certifications, including the registration in the System for Award Management, SAM.gov, and the certifications and representations that have to be accomplished there, each and every one of those entities has to have accomplished those. Each and every one of the entities has to send in all the additional certifications that we require. And then each and every one of the entities will have to sign the grant agreement and be responsible for the performance of all of its partners on that agreement. So uh, administratively, in terms of applying and in terms of post-award, the informal without a host is going to be the most onerous for everyone involved. But it can be done if it's essential, if that's the way, the only way the entities can work together and agree to get this funding then go ahead and apply that way. But just recognize that there's some additional administrative and time costs that, that are going to have to be invested to make it work. Eligible grant purposes. Acquiring by lease or purchase eligible equipment. Now, what is eligible equipment? Um, it's the equipment that is essential to the deployment of the, the telecommunications setup 
either for the distance learning or the, or the telemedicine, as we described at the outset. It can include broadband facilities. If there are broadband facilities included, though, no more than 20% of the grant amount can be used for those facilities. And we'll talk a little bit more about broadband facilities in particular are typically the only thing that's going to lead to some sort of disruption of the outside environment. For example, if you needed to put a couple of miles of cable into a particular um, school or a hub site, and that requires some additional environmental work up front. There can be uh, some lease costs covered, but since we have a three-year advance period for the grant, it's only the cost of the lease during that three-year period that can be funded by the grant. If you're leasing beyond that three-year period, that's going to have to be paid for in a different way. There's also software, instructional programming uh, that can be uh, acquired as long as it's a capital asset. And there is some technical assistance that can be funded as well. Although, just like in the case of the broadband facilities, there is a percentage limit, no more than 10% of the grant. And what that means is when you're paying someone else to do the installation, uh, do some training of staff so that staff knows how to use the equipment, that's the kind of thing that we mean by technical assistance. Here are some different examples of eligible equipment. I'll let you read that at your leisure. There is one thing that you might see in red, though, next to broadband facilities that I should emphasize. I already mentioned that broadband facilities can only uh, use up to 20% of the grant amount. In addition, the broadband facilities, just like all the grant-funded facilities, must be owned by the applicant or the grantee after an award. Sometimes people are putting together an application and the local ISP is able to make a connection, but there's a substantial fee because maybe there's a couple of miles of, of cable necessary in order to create that connection. So let's say that the charge is $16,000, $16,000 to hook you up. Well, that's not going to be something that can be funded by the grant because once that $16,000 is paid to create that connection, the equipment so funded is not owned by the applicant. It's owned by the communications provider. So unless the communications provider itself is the applicant, which is possible, um, but unless that's the case, in that scenario I just laid out, those broadband facilities can't be funded by a grant. Anything that's included, any equipment that's included, because you see computer hardware and software and, and, and inside wiring audio video, video equipment, such things are ubiquitous in DLT projects. But if they're proposed for a project, they must truly be related to the project. You can't necessarily take every computer that the hospital was going to need during the next three years and think that that's going to be acceptable as part of the grant budget. Only the equipment that is specifically tied to the project as described and laid out in the application is what's going to be deemed eligible. And as, as is mentioned here, the predominant purpose of every line item has to meet that grant definition. Ineligible grant purposes, probably uh, the most important thing on this list that I should emphasize that is not eligible is salaries, administrative, operating, or recurring expenses, this third item, third bullet. This comes up all the time. And it comes up even on categories that otherwise would be eligible, because if the applicant proposes to have its own staff do, let's say, the development of instructional programming or do the installation of equipment, it's perfectly reasonable that trained people on staff would do that work. But at that point, it can't be funded by the grant. We cannot reimburse the applicant or the project for those salaries that are paid to staff, whether medical or other technical staff. And, and similarly, those kind of costs cannot be considered as matching. Matching contributions can only be items which could have been funded by the grant. So uh, another common area of, of questioning and sometimes frustration on the part of applicants is that certain costs to operate the system cannot be considered as in-kind matching for the project. 
we pretty easily convince people that we can only fund certain things with the grant. But then a lot of times uh, people will look at a project and say, well, to really make this project work, I'm going to have to pay staff. i got to pay my, my faculty to teach classes. I need to pay my um, uh, physicians to treat patients. And of course, that's reasonable. But that's not specifically part of the grant project. I think the way to look at the DLT program is that the program is here to help fund the equipment and software necessary to equip the project, but then the operation of the project is not what the grant is here to fund. And that's different from certain other grant programs. There are other grant programs out there that help a certain service be offered for a limited period of time, and they're covering all of the administrative costs during that time. And even though there is a three-year period for construction of the project in advance of the grant funds with the DLT program, that doesn't mean that the DLT program is covering all of the costs necessary to operate any particular project during that time. Instead, it's acquiring the equipment, it's acquiring the software, it's making it possible to use the technology to offer the, the education, the medical care at a distance. It, it isn't covering every cost involved with it. So when you get back to the matching, 15% of the grant amount is required. Uh, we have a number of different worksheets that we have posted on the website to help in these various calculations that we throw out there, like what is the matching contribution or, or keeping tabs on, on the budget items and how they tally up. So, so please make liberal use of those. They're there for your, for your use. And um, this calculation is one of them because uh, it is always comparing the amount of matching contribution, whether coming from the applicant or from someone else who is willing to contribute funds to that applicant. That matching contribution is then being compared to the amount of the grant. So we're talking about 15% of the grant amount that's requested or required to make the project work. It's a little different than saying 15% of the total project budget. It's close, but not quite the same thing. So if you are asking for a million dollars of grant funding, then there has to be a matching contribution of $150,000. Emphasizing again that um, this must be for a purpose that would be otherwise eligible for grant funding. And uh, you can't use other federal funds under most circumstances as matching funds. There are some exceptions out there. We cite at least one such exception in the application guide. And if you receive funds from a federal entity, then those funds have a specific exemption that says that they can be used as match for another federal award, then we just ask that you provide that documentation to us when you request a grant. Discounts are not an eligible match. This used to be a big problem because uh, applications would come in in which an applicant was saying, well, I'm buying a certain amount of equipment, but then a certain amount of that equipment is being donated by the entity from whom I'm buying this other equipment. Well, obviously that really gets down to kind of a negotiation. It's no different than if you went down to the Home Depot and said, rather than buying one wheelbarrow um, for $40, how much would you charge me if I bought 100 wheelbarrows? They'd probably cut you a better deal. And um, the same thing happens when you're buying computers, audio equipment, wiring, or other things that might be necessary to set up a DLT project. Therefore, any kind of vendor discounts or supplied equipment coming from a vendor is not going to be considered an eligible match. There are some special matching provisions for a, a few insular territories that are mentioned here. These are not specifically tied to the statutes that underlie the DLT program. These are just federal government statutes that already exist. So sometimes we've had questions from other areas, why, why don't we have that special dispensation? Um, these are just legal requirements that exist and we're working with them. It wasn't something specifically set up for DLT. It just happens to apply to DLT as well as to other programs. So scoring. I mentioned at the outset, or rather when we talked about the funding for the DLT program for this second window and for the first window, that the demand has been strong. When the demand for the funds is strong, then the scoring is extremely important. 
the maximum possible score is 110 points. And if you can get 110 points, there is an extremely high probability your project is going to get funded. But the farther away you get from 110 points, the less likely it is that your project is going to get funded. 80 of those points are objective. That is, you know, assuming you did your, your ciphering right, you know when you apply how much of that 80 points your application will garner. We're going to double check your, your, your facts and your figures, but you should know up front the 80 points, how much you're going to get. We'll talk about those in just a moment. But the subjective criteria, well, that's where you have to do a, uh, a job of writing up what the needs and benefits are. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. So the first of the objective criteria is rurality. And that was also one of the things that got mentioned on the slide that talked about what's different about the second window from the first window. And what's different is uh, in the first window, we were only talking about needing to start with the site worksheet. The site worksheet is where you list every location that's going to receive equipment. Some are considered as end user sites, and those are locations where the rural residents will receive the benefits, whether it's educational or medical, from this system. Then there are other sites that are designated as hub sites, and that's where the experts are, that's where the, the education is coming from, uh, where the teachers are, it's where the medical professionals are who are offering services, and there are also sites that have both. And the most common example of that is an educational arrangement where multiple school districts are getting interconnected so that a, uh, a teacher with specific credentials at one school might teach students in uh, a different rural school and vice versa and kind of swap faculty and swap expertise. So then we'll call those hub end user sites. But when you have those sites, then you go into this rurality worksheet and you determine the rurality score for each site. And if a site is deemed not to be rural, it gets a score of zero. If it's deemed to be rural in a given site, then the score is either 20, 30, or 40, the highest being for the, the most rural location. But there are two components to how rural a location is. One is the simple and most straightforward one, and that's where if you go to the last three pages of the application guide, there's a description of how to use the revised data tools on the census site in order to check the population of a given town, a town where a particular end user site is located. And the population is a major determinant of that, but there is one other component, an urbanized area which is located uh, and adjacent to other urban areas with a population of over 50,000 gets designated as non-rural as well. So it is possible to be in a community that has a given name and has a low number population and yet is considered non-rural because of its proximity to a much larger community. Such examples abound around Washington, D.C. Uh, like other major cities, Washington has a number of small named communities around it, places like uh, Chevy Chase, Maryland, and uh, Falls Church, Virginia. And if you look at the population of those, uh, a number of those communities have populations of their own that are under 20,000, so it might look like they're rural, but they're right next to Washington, D.C. Because they're right next to Washington, D.C., this urbanized area um, definition is going to say, no, those are non-rural, and reasonably so. So, we know a lot of people struggle with trying to figure out whether or not their community is going to be rural or non-rural. The link, and I know that it's a very long link, usually when I'm sending out emails and I say click here and I hide the, the details of the link, but I know some people might read this slide and then try to type it in themselves. So I pasted the whole link as it really appears. This is a link to the DLT map that we have on our website. And we've added a layer to our DLT map for non-rural determination. If you go to that link, and we will be posting uh, the slides from this webinar for use, but you can go right now to the DLT website. You click on that tab to apply where so many of the resources are located, and there is a map there, a map of recently funded areas. You click on that map, and it'll show you all sorts of colored dots that indicate where recently funded projects are located. But if you go to the top right corner of the map, 
there's a, a layer. You can choose layers to turn on and turn off. By default, all those layers to show you the projects funded in 2017 through 2019 are already checked. But if you uncheck all of them and leave checked only the non-rural area layer, then the map does nothing except show you which areas are considered non-rural. Anything that's labeled in that shaded non-rural area either fails the test of rurality because the community itself is over 20,000 or because it's in proximity to an urban area of over 50,000. So if you then use that map and type in uh, an address for any site, you can look and see if it lands in the shaded area, and it's kind of a buff color, so you, know, you do have to look a little bit carefully. But if it lands in the shaded area, you know you have an urbanized area or you have a population of that community over 20,000. If it lands outside of that non-rural shaded area, then you know the only thing left for you to check is to go to the census uh, and, and double check the population of the community. When you fill in our rurality worksheet, it's a little different from the rurality worksheet from window one. It has an additional column where we ask you, is it contiguous to an urban area with a population over 50,000? If so, what's the name of that community? So in the example I gave, if you were filling it out for Chevy Chase, Maryland, you'd say, yes, I am adjacent to something that's Washington, D.C. So similarly for your communities, you fill it out. Um, remember a minimum rurality score, and that's taking all of the end user sites and averaging them. A minimum rurality score of 20 is required to go forward with the project. So one thing I emphasize for everybody, if you are considering applying to the DLT program for a grant, figure out where your sites are, your end user sites or, and your hub sites. Then do this rurality calculation. If your score is under 20, there's no point in doing the rest of the work. Now, I bolded one other thing in the middle of this slide. Non-fixed end-user site projects have a rurality determined by hub locations. Many, many people are talking to us now, more so than ever before, about non-fixed end-user site projects. What is a non-fixed end-user site project? That just basically means instead of having rural community facilities, rural schools, rural health clinics that are getting equipped so that students or patients can go to those places to receive educational or medical services, people are talking about providing those services to individuals in their homes. When you're serving individuals in their homes, we're going to say that's a non-fixed end user site because we don't know where those people are. You don't know where those people are year over year. You don't know where the patients will be right now. A year from now, those patients will be in different places. Similarly, schools, uh, where the students are, keeps changing over time. So if you're coming to us with that kind of a project and there has to be some sort of equipment funded by the grant going to each of those home locations or we're not going to consider it an end user site. But assuming there is equipment, assuming that it has the predominant telemedicine or distance learning use, then we're going to figure out the rurality based off of the location of the hub site. And so um, I talked to somebody just the other day who is at a university, has many, many students who live in quite rural places but the university itself is in a large city. In that case, it's a non-fixed end user site project, but the hub location is in a place of more than 200,000 people. Well, then that's not eligible for the program. doesn't matter how rural the places are where the services are going to be received. If it's a non-fixed end user site project, the only proxy we have to figure out the rurality is the hub location. Economic need is, is the same as before. It's, a, it's using that same site worksheet, and then you just have to check the small area income and poverty estimates percentage for the counties in which those sites are located. We provided that data on the website. It's the same data we used for window one. It's data from the Census Bureau that was released in December 2019. It's actually data for uh, the calendar year 2018. But it just shows the percentage of poverty for the county. So you figure out all the different end user sites you have, you record on the worksheet the poverty percentage for each of the counties, 
you average those poverty percentages and you come up with an average poverty percentage for all the, the counties uh, on the list. And in some cases, you may have three end user sites in the same county. Well, that means that the, that county number gets added into the average calculation three times. Then you come down to a final uh, state percentage overall, and then you just go to the table to figure out do you get zero, 10, 20, or 30 overall. There are some sites, particularly uh, insular territories and some other um, compact free association nations in the Pacific that are eligible for this program for which there is no SAFE data. If there is no SAFE data for an end user site, then you just plug in a SAFE percentage of 30% for that location. Special consideration points, 10 points can be received for this. You can get it for STEM education, you can get it for opioid or other substance use disorder, or you can get it for an opportunity zone. There's no double dipping, so if you're both STEM education and you're in an opportunity zone, you're still only going to get 10 points. This is the same as it was last time. Pretty straightforward. Just to go through it, STEM education, it's, it's broad-based. This isn't, this isn't just math classes. This also can be uh, practical classes, medical technologist training, that sort of thing. Um, anything that's related to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics disciplines. Uh, on a purely academic or practical um, type of education, adults or children, is STEM. Opioid or other substance use disorder, similar to the opioid services that have been uh, uh, funded the last couple years by this program, but it's not limited to the treatment of, of opioids. There is a, a form that we provide um, for the determination of um, special consideration points where we ask you to mark which category applies. In addition, in your executive summary, you should be discussing the details of your project. And if you're dealing with substance use of any type, you should be discussing what type of, of uh, treatments you're con intending to offer and what problems you're trying to address. Specifically, if you're trying to address opioid uh, uh, use disorder, then that should get mentioned because when we talked about the different types of funding available, we do continue to carry forward at the moment some of that opioid-specific funding, and so we want to know if a project should be so considered and if it would be eligible for those funds if any are still available. And we list a lot of different related uh, type of treatment and education uh, related to substance use disorder that qualifies for this, this, uh, uh, this special scoring. Opportunity zones are just uh, some distressed communities uh, eligible for preferential tax treatment. We just give you a link because uh, um, that's certified by the Secretary of the Treasury. That's not within agriculture. We don't control that list, but we do provide a link to you so that you can identify whether or not your end user site planned in an opportunity zone. If at least one does, you're eligible for this additional scoring. The subject of needs. I want to spend a moment or two on this because it's so important. It's so important because in a competitive environment, the points you get here very likely will determine whether or not your project is going to score high enough to get funded. So you can, it, it's best not just to rely on the fact that your executive summary was well worded and it's going to address these things, although it should be dealing with them as well. But when you're in the objective scoring section of the application, do yourself a favor and write some specific documents addressing needs and benefits. You want to talk about why is this project needed in your community or communities uh, that are being affected by it? What are the challenges? What are the problems? And remember, think, think broadly. And I want to divert just for a moment to mention, I know right now everyone is concerned about issues uh, related to COVID-19. And these have affected the way educational services are delivered in many places, and they've had an impact, of course, on, on healthcare providers. And I've had more than a few folks who have called in, and they want to talk about the elements of a grant proposal that they're thinking about because of their current challenges. But remember, if you are applying for a grant for our program for the application period that ends mid-July, then we are going to score all those applications, the eligible ones, against one another. 
Awards will be made sometime in the latter part of the calendar year. Legal documents will be prepared and there will be a period of time that those documents get signed and returned and finally funds get available. So best case scenario, applicants who submit in July have some grant funds available to spend in early 2021. Well, then there's a three-year period to draw down those grant funds to build out the project that was proposed. So if we assume, as is reasonable, that somewhere around the midpoint of that is when uh, quite a few projects get built to the point that they're able to start delivering the services intended. We're talking about a year and a half from early 2021. We're talking about the mid to latter part of 2022. Well, it's very likely that by the mid to latter part of 2022, the situation in terms of dealing with the current pandemic is going to be very different than it is right now. So a project that you're developing, it may be that the current environment has focused your thinking, and that's not bad. But make sure that the project that you're building is not one that just makes sense today, but one that would make sense even in an environment that is not so much like today, which is going to be a few years forward. We're looking for projects that are going to be meeting needs of rural residents for a number of years. You know, one of the components of, of an application is financial information and sustainability. We're looking for projects that are gonna to continue to operate beyond the three years of the advance period. So don't think overly short term in this. And here's the place where you're gonna talk about not just short-term needs. You're gonna talk about the need for services that have already been in place. Don't focus overly much on just the unique situation in which we find ourselves at the moment. And similarly, then when you're talking about benefits, you want to keep a larger time frame in mind. What will be the benefits derived from the community from your project if it is funded, if it's built out? And put in some numbers to the extent you can. If you're talking about educational, offerings, how many students are you talking about to receive this kind of instruction? If you're talking about medical care, talk about uh, um, uh, travel time saved, cost saved, hopefully lives saved in some instances. And also focus on that local community involvement. Have you been reaching out to the local community? I know community gatherings are not possible right now, but there's a lot of listservs, there's a lot of, of uh, email outreach, there's a lot of ways to reach out to people. It doesn't all just involve a bunch of people sitting in a room and talking about your proposal. The grant application, uh, we have a framework for it, and we ask you to follow this framework in the way that you designate the sections of your application. When it's time to uh, um, document your compliance with other federal statutes, uh, some of those are in SAM.gov. I'm going to talk about that in just a second, but some of them are still connected to your application. For this, you're signing a checklist. This is another document that's on our website. And when you sign that checklist, you're making additional certifications and supplying some uh, additional supplemental narrative statements where necessary. The most necessary is on the environmental side. If your proposal includes broadband facilities that uh, do anything in the natural environment, lay some cable, build a tower, and there are some substantial environmental review protocols that you have to follow, and that's laid out in the application guide. The System for Award Management, or SAM.gov, has for a number of years been something that every applicant has to be registered in before applying, and you may must maintain that registration throughout the time that you have the financial assistance. But there are additional financial assistance certifications and representations that you have to make with your account. You can be registered in SAM.gov and not have these, these grant financial assistance certifications and representations made. So you do need to make sure that those are done. So go back into your SAM.gov registration before submitting. Make sure that your registration is current. Make sure that you've made these financial assistance certifications and representations. In addition, you have to be registered in SAM.gov. Just go back up for a second. You have to be registered in SAM.gov before you can register in Grants.gov. And both of those things are necessary to apply. Note that I say that it can take up to 12 to 15 business days after submitting a SAM registration for it to be active. So plan accordingly. 
I said a few slides back, if you are working on a proposal, you want to do that rurality determination for your project once you know where your sites are and figure out whether or not you are sufficiently rural to apply to this program. Because if you're not, please don't waste your time. You'll just get mad at us. But this is another place where you really need to plan ahead. So I'd say as soon as you determine that you're good on the rurality side, turn to SAM.gov. Make sure you're registered in SAM.gov. Make sure that you make the financial assistance certifications and representations that you indicate that you either have already received or plan to apply for financial assistance from the federal government, and then it allows you to make certain certifications, read over them, and, and only make them if they're appropriate. But once you've gotten that address, then go over to grants.gov and register for grants.gov. It requires your SAM.gov registration first. So you can't do the one without the other. Um, I've had folks tell me that when they went to register for SAM.gov, they realized that even though the legal name of their entity had changed some years ago, the hospital used to be X and now it's Y, nobody had bothered to change it in all the requisite places. And so you have to allow yourself enough time to sort out those kind of glitches if they occur in your situation because you got to get all that ironed out before you're going to be able to get your registration processed in SAM. You really need to allow at least three weeks if you're not currently registered in SAM and you're not registered in grants.gov, allow yourself at least three weeks. Remember, our application is due mid-July. It means don't go in July 1 and get started on this part of the process. Start this part of the process no later than June 1, preferably uh, sometime this month because you want to get this out of the way. It's not hard. It doesn't require that much time from you, but it requires time for the people who have to process the materials that you submit because there is a review protocol that's, that's followed using documents that you provide to SAM.gov. And you've got to allow some time for some back and forth if there are some issues with what you provide initially. The DLT worksheets, I've already touched on the fact that we have these worksheets available for you on our website. Um, the site worksheet is the starting point. That's where you list all of your hub and end user sites. You've got to have that to do the rest of the calculations. The rurality calculation, the economic need calculation, they're based off of that site worksheet. So you've got to do the site worksheet first. Similarly, when you get down to the all-important budget worksheet, you're going to tie it back to those same sites so that people are clear what you're talking about, where is that equipment going, which hub site, which end user site. And uh, the, the other worksheets are important as well. We've got them all wrapped into just one Excel workbook with a bunch of different tabs on it, uh, easy to find, um, and I think fairly easy to use. Remember, application submission, the deadline is July 13th. They all have to be grants.gov. And the submission cutoff is 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time, which right now means Eastern Daylight Time. So if you are in California, if you are in Alaska, if you are in Hawaii, it, it doesn't matter what that it might not yet be midnight where you are. It might still be early evening, but grants.gov is going to cut it off 11.59 Eastern Time. So please bear that in mind. And... Uh, also, bear in mind that all those registrations have to have been done first. One thing I need to mention about grants.gov, some people who are very familiar with grants.gov because they apply for a lot of different grants for a lot of different purposes have been a little bit surprised when they got in for the first time to apply for a DLT grant because they searched this up and I've had people call me or email me and say, something's wrong with your, your system in grants.gov. So what's the problem? Say, I give them the workspace and I can't upload anything into it. What's wrong here? I only, or they say, all I see is the Form 424. Where's the rest of it? We have kind of a toe in the water with respect to grants.gov. It's an electronic portal that we use to bring in applications that used to come to us in a box with a bunch of paper. But we didn't build an elaborate electronic application process <clears throat> in grants.gov. Rather, when you get to grants.gov, when you get through and you're properly registered, all you're going to see there is a Form 424. It doesn't take very long to complete, just some basic information about 
who your entity is, what's your DUNS, what's your what's your um, TIN, uh, who are your contact people, what's your address, what's your congressional district, how much money are you asking for, how much money do you intend to um, contribute as matching. And that's about it. It looks too easy. And it is too easy because there's a whole lot more to it. When you're going through the 424 form, right after block 15, there's a little button that says add attachments. That's where you're going to take all the other pieces that you completed as laid out in the application guide as we've been discussing during this presentation. So that's going to be your site worksheet, your rurality worksheet, your economic calculation, your special consideration, your matching funds, your uh, certifications. It's going to be the important narratives that you wrote up. It's going to be your scope of work plan that says when all these things are going to happen. It's going to include matching commitment letters from anybody who's providing funds to you from the outside, signed by somebody who's actually able to promise that money. It's going to show that you've consulted with the USDA Rural Development State Director. It's going to have a lot of pieces to it. It's going to have a budget, and that budget needs to show that it, it's for the same amount as you're going to put on that 424 form, not more than a million dollars, not less than $50,000 in grant request with an appropriate matching request. It's going to have all of those pieces in there, and all of those documents are going to get attached to this one and only SF-424 by clicking that button. So the filling in the SF-424 on grants.gov is sort of the last step that you do. But getting yourself registered so that you can do that is one of the first steps that you do. So start out, you figure out this program looks like it can work for you, check your rurality first. You'll have to do a certain amount of planning so you know where your sites are and you know what we mean by sites. And then if your rurality score is at least 20, and hopefully a lot more than that, and so you've decided to go forward, well then make sure your SAM.gov registration, your grants.gov registration are in order. And then go back and work on all the other pieces. Now when you're working on all those other pieces, sometimes you're going to need some assistance. We've got a website. The website has a lot of information. I'm assuming most of you are familiar with it because to register for this session, you have to go to the website, or at least go to a link off of that website to register for the webinar. And these webinar slides will be up within a day or two. The webinar itself will be recorded and available sometime after that. There's an application guide up there. I know in some ways it seems a little voluminous, but a lot of it is just going through and explaining things in some detail so that when you open up the rurality worksheet and then you're scratching your head about it, you go to the section on rurality and it makes more sense to you. Or when you're, you know, you're trying to check the, the population and you're not familiar with the new search tool that the census has provided, you flip to that part of the guide and it walks you through it. You're trying to sign the, the, the certifications and you want to know what you're certifying to, the things that aren't captured right now in SAM.gov, well, those are printed out in the application guide so that you know what it is that you're agreeing to. So all those resources hopefully will be very helpful. But sometimes you need to talk to somebody, somebody who's familiar with the local area, familiar with the, the, the situation in your state, who maybe knows some of the broadband challenges that you're facing because clearly uh, most every application is first and foremost going to need some decent broadband service in order to offer the educational or medical opportunities that we want to help fund with DLT. So we have general field representatives throughout the country. If you're on our website, anywhere on the RV website, there's a blue bar across the top. And if you click on the far right hand side, it says contact us. And that drop down always has Telecom GFR. We've also provided the link right here on this slide. So if you click on that list, you, it'll, you can get a text only version if you want that lists all the general field representatives. But also, you can just see a map of the US, double click on the state where you are, and you'll get the contact information for the GFR who serves your area. In some cases where somebody's pretty new, there may be two names because they're basically a mentor and as well as the new GFR there. But the first person is the person you can reach out to. And reach out to that person. 
there's an email address, there's a phone number. As long as you don't wait until 15 days prior to the closing date, which basically means don't wait till the end of June. Um, instead, month of May is a good time to do this. Reach out to the GFR, talk through your project. If you have a little bit of confusion over what's eligible, what's not, that person is a resource. All of those GFRs have access to those of us here in Washington. Most of the time, they don't need to use them. But if you pose an unusual or an interesting question, then you can go to them. But you, if you have a question that, that's programmatic in nature, you just want to toss it in here to us, you can certainly do that. We have a DLT mailbox. Some of you are already familiar with it. There are a number of us who, who uh, field questions into it, some in Washington. Some are actually GFRs assisting with that. And so that's just dltinfo at usda.gov. You can always send emails to that. You can also call us in the national office using the phone number show. And uh, those calls will, will uh, be another, another resource. But like I said, for your specific project in your specific state, please use your general field representatives. They're, they're excellent at what they do. So with that, I am going to um, turn it back over to um, the, the questions. And I think, uh, Sean, is it, is it you who are going to uh, encapsulate the questions that we're going to try to answer here? Sure, I will be happy to do that. Um, and before we get started, I, I know you've already said this, Richard, but um, there's been a lot of questions on will the slides be made available. And as Richard said, yes, the slides are going to be made available. They're going to be put on our website. As is this a recording of this entire webinar. So those will be both posted on our website subsequent to this presentation. Um, another one, another thing I wanted to point out, a number of you noticed during the presentation that uh, when you tried to click on the DLT map that the, the link didn't quite work. And I, I checked it myself and yet yeah, it looks like it's pointed wrong. Um, but if you go to the DLT web pages, if you want to go back to the previous slide, Richard, um, Sure. If you go to the DLT web page there, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a link to the map right there on the, the very first paragraph. So if you go there, click on that link, you'll be able to see that map and take a look at, and, and take a look at the, the projects that are funded in morality and such. So, um, so why don't I, at this point, we can get started on the, the Q&A. And there's over 200 questions. Obviously, we're not going to be able to get through all the questions today. We're going to get through as many as possible. Um, but as Richard said, reach out. If, you, if we don't get to your questions, just reach out to us um, subsequent to, to this uh, presentation. Um, reach out to one of the general field representatives. Send a question to the DLT inbox, and we'll be happy to, to answer your question there. All right, so first question. Um, is a software solution that allows for bidirectional exchange of information during a telehealth visit covered? Well, a software solution can be part of a proposal, but it can't be the entirety of the proposal. As we say in the application guide, and as I believe I said during the presentation, we're only going to consider a site to be an end user site if there's some grant-funded equipment being placed there. So if you're talking about a, a proposal and the entirety of the proposal is a software solution, and I have had people call and ask about this, um, then we're going to say, well, that in and of itself will not constitute a project because without equipment, we don't have end user sites. And if you think about it, there, there's, it, it's kind of a, a conundrum for us. We have a program that's only eligible to fund services in rural areas of the country. We can have some expenditures in non-rural areas, but the beneficiaries have to be in those rural areas. So if we don't have end user sites that we can target, a software solution can be used to serve people anywhere. So there's really no way for us to know where the proposal is going to be used, where who's going to benefit from the software, if there's not some sort of end user component. So it can't be the totality of a project, it can be part of a project. All right, let's go to the next one. If our end users are K-12 students receiving distance education in their rural homes right across one or more counties, how do we define end user sites for the purpose of calculating rurality 
and economic need percentage poverty. Is this what DLT means by a non-fixed end user application? And I can say with confidence that yes, that is what's meant by a non-fixed end user site application. Um, in that case, if you don't have fixed end user sites, then that's what we that's how we define it. And the, the hub site would be what to use um, for those determinations. Do you have anything else to add to that, Richard? The only other thing we run into that is uh, remember there's going to be some equipment components that's going to have to be going to students' homes, and the, you're going to have to make a, an effort to make sure that the equipment is predominantly used for the distance learning purpose. If you just hand out computers, it's difficult to represent, and they have no restrictions on them, that they're primarily going to be used for educational purposes because, because they will just become a general purpose device. So there needs to be at least a good faith, faith effort to restrict the equipment so that it's primarily used for the educational purpose. All right. Next question. If we applied under Window 1, can we apply again under Window 2? Um, an applicant can certainly uh, uh, apply a second time, just like a particular applicant can submit multiple applications in this round or could have done multiple applications in last round, and some did. It's just that each project applied for needs to be distinct and needs to stand alone and not be reliant upon the other project in order to function. It's in the regs and it's also common sense that we won't make an award that depends on another award in order to function. It's got to work on its own. All right. Next question, what percentage of RUS grant applications get approved? And I'll take a stab at this. It really depends on the demand that we get. So as Richard mentioned last year, um, we had more dollars available than we've received applications. So 100% of the applications that were eligible and submitted to us were actually approved. Um, traditionally, historically, it's been more around 45 to 50% historically um, that get approved of eligible applications. So it, you've got a pretty good shot in, in this particular grant program. This year, as, as Richard mentioned, we seem to be oversubscribed in the first round. Um, no idea yet how that's gonna turn out. Um, and then, of course, in the second round, we have uh, approximately $25 million available. So we'll see how many applications, it'll depend on how many applications we get in the second round as well. Uh, next question, can hotspots be included in a DLT grant application? Well, when you're talking about the hotspot, there's really two different components. One is the device and the other is the service over that device. The service over that device, um, if you're talking about using a cellular system in order to provide some uh, data carrying capacity, that's a recurrent or operating charge, and, and we're not gonna make a grant to pay the ongoing cellular charge to make that hotspot work. But if you had some sort of an arrangement where that hotspot was a component that you were using to make sure that there was uh, data carrying capacity necessary to power a device that you were providing to uh, a rural recipient of services, then the device itself could be funded. All right. Next question, what is, what is total funding available for this round? It's going to be 25 million at minimum. Um, if uh, there are recoveries from previous awards that are made available, we would add to that. Generally, from year to year, that ends up being a couple million dollars, but a minimum of $25 million would be available this round. Uh, next question. Can you clarify ineligibility of projects in coastal barrier resource act areas, projects located in areas covered by the coastal Mapping tool that's provided um, to identify if uh, an end user site where equipment would be placed is in one of those coastal barrier areas, and we're not permitted to fund in those areas. That's, it's in the regulation. It's it's uh, it's not a stipulation that we can wave away. So if you draw up a project and you find you have an end user site there, then delete it from the project. And if the sum to if all of your project is there, then we're not going to be able to 
provide funding for it. All right, so the next question is, I work for WIC on the local level in Georgia. Am I able to apply for the grant for my district? We are 100% federally funded. Hmm. Um, that sounds like uh, there might be some legal determination involved. Uh, I would recommend that uh, when, when, if you were to put it in an application, and this applies to everybody. We didn't bother to talk about every particular element of the application. It's certainly covered in some detail in the application guide, but in, in, in Section J of an application, you're always providing evidence of legal existence. And uh, so every entity is going to provide, whether articles of incorporation or, or some sort of statute or whatever designates uh, how does your entity exist. And so I would recommend to that applicant uh, that why don't you just provide that to us in an email to the DLT info box, we'll look it over, and then we can consult with legal counsel and get back to you. All right, next question. Um, is the eligibility for students in 100% online academic instruction based on spring enrollment or based on today's numbers of students 100% online academic instruction? I'm not, I'm personally not sure of the relevance of this. Can you ferret that out, Richard? Or I, I'm not quite sure because, uh, you know, we, yeah. we don't have any particular numbers of students that we're tallying up. Uh, the uh, rurality of a location is based on 2010 census, which isn't going to change any time this year. Um, and so uh, the, the number of students that, that someone might have enrolled, that might influence the amount of equipment that you're proposing for a project. Um, but other than that, we're just going to say for any project, propose the amount of equipment that seemed reasonable to you. Certainly things change over time in terms of specific needs and enrollments. Next question, um, is there any way we can find past applications that have been approved to use as guidance? Now, with respect to what those applications did, there are previous year award summaries on our webpage for each application that was funded. Um, if you go to the, the webpage and go to to apply, there's a, and scroll down, there's previous award summaries, summaries and you can scroll through those, but as far as the, uh, uh, the applications themselves, Richard, do you want to take a stab at that? Well, we don't have the applications uh, posted. Um, and, uh, I, I suppose uh, you know, there's, a, there's always the opportunity, just as in any uh, uh, federal procurement, for there to be Freedom of Information Act requests submitted, but those take time to, to process. Sometimes the most straightforward way is um, most successful applicants are willing to talk some about what they did and, and how it worked for them. So I've told many people in the past, if you just look on to the listing Sean mentioned of uh, successful awards from past years, it lists the name, the amount, and a few sentence description of what they got it for. If you look at a couple and say, wow, that's kind of like what I want to do, uh, most of the time you just look up that entity um, you can find some information and reach out to them. Say, I'd like to talk to a little you a little bit about what you what you did, so that I can do it. And most of the time, as long as they're not uh, desperately busy with something else at the moment, they'll they'll offer some assistance. All right. Next question: How are applications from adjoining or overlapping jurisdictions judged? Well, um, if what is being asked is, is about kind of a duplication issue, because you know we we won't fund applications that duplicate service. Um, so, in the unlikely event that um, similar applications came in at a similar time, and we were trying to figure out which one to fund, then it's now we're going to boil down to who scores better. Um, and there is a non-replication component that's always re referenced in every application. 
you have to make a statement about uh, to what extent there is any duplication. And if you are a past recipient of the BLT grant or you have another pending application, you have to discuss how does this current application relate to the application that you did in the past. So I, I, if there's something more to that question than that, I, I don't know what it is. Yeah, and I'm unaware of any, you know, even in the past of any applications of similar nature that had overlapped at specific uh, end user location for the same purpose. I mean, you can overlap, but if it's for different purposes and for different functions, then I don't think that would be a problem. Would you concur, Richard? Yeah. In fact, I had a couple people in just in the last couple of weeks who reached out to me and said, hey, I'm submitting an application to do this particular type of project, and I've been contacted by somebody else who's applying who would like me to be an end user site for theirs. But they were fairly different in terms of the things that they were doing. And I said, well, that's, the fact that you're involved in two projects is not a problem. If they were the same kind of thing, that would be a problem. But if, if you, um, uh, for example, we've had the same schools involved in a distance learning project and then also involved in a telehealth project because there was some sort of uh, setup being uh, arranged for some sort of health outreach in schools. Well, that's, you know, they're an end user site for more than one location, for more than one project. But that's okay because they were doing different things with different technology for different reasons. All right. Another common question that we get on our DLT inbox is, is there guidance on how to format the application documents regarding text size, spacing, and any page limit? And uh, I would answer that by saying, no, we don't have any guidance. There is no page limit. Um, just be reasonable, I guess, in, in your submittal. Do you have anything else to add to that, Richard? There is only uh, one unusual little page limit, and it deals with the statement of experience. For reasons that I, I can't quite discern, we have in the regulation that the statement of experience should not exceed three single-spaced pages. So other than that, um, yeah, no, no limitations, as, as Sean said. Uh, just reasonableness as your test. All right, next question. Does this program apply to schools that are blended? We accommodate our rural population by providing real-time virtual instruction two to three days a week, blended with a face-to-face -face model two days a week. Would this grant still apply to us if we were hoping to use it to improve our virtual real-time instruction delivery? Um, I think the difficulty there is it sounds like there may currently be a system in place to provide some level of distance learning. And we do have the prohibition on duplication, so mere enhancement of an existing arrangement might not be eligible. There would have to be something that's unique and going farther and beyond um, before uh, it can be fundable. So that's certainly something that would have to be um, spelled out in the application. All right. Next question. If we are providing services to persons in their homes, do we use the hub site as the address in the worksheets? Does this mean there would be no addresses listed for end user sites? So to me, what this means is a non-site specific type application. Um, and in that case, yes, uh, the hub site would be how would you, you would use to determine morality, economic need, you'd want to thoroughly describe what you're doing with respect to the non-site specific um, type application in your, in your write-up. So we wouldn't right. want you uh, to be listing individuals' homes anyhow. Uh, that would be problematic from a uh, uh, personally identifiable information standpoint. Next question, what's the grant period for window two? Um, I'm not exactly sure this, if it's application period, it's applying through July 13th. If it's the period of performance, that would be, it's, it's generally three years from the date in the grant agreement. So once we award grants, we send out a grant agreement, the time period to, to implement your project is you have three years from the date that would be in your grant agreement. 
Next question. Our yeah, there is a few. Have... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I've had this question because I believe there's a, a, a period of performance dates that are requested on the 424. So I would typically say just, just pick a, a start date sometime in the latter part of the year, November or December, they like December 1, and, and then just add three years to it because uh, the advanced period covers three years. Of course, if you, you, you implement in a shorter time frame, there's obviously nothing wrong with that. As Richard said, three years is the, is the maximum period. But um, obviously, if you, if you implement within three months, that's, that's great, too. And we're happy to advance out the money mm -hmm. uh, if you're awarded. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. Are applicants who have or have not received prior awards given precedence, as often happens in such award programs? You know, there's no there's no preference given to prior applicants, and in fact, they've got an additional um, burden in that they are required to discuss what they have done in the past and and how this relates to the current project to make sure that we're not essentially funding the same thing multiple times. But there are certain applicants who have received a number of awards. To a certain extent, that may reflect that uh, some applicants get very good at understanding the different components that need to be provided, and they identify other high-scoring, high rurality areas of need in the portion of the country where they exist. And we're not going to fault somebody for doing a good job for extending services in new places. They're, they're not getting any preference. We don't see them and say, gee, we really like these people. Let's give them a lot of points. Each application has to stand on its own. That doesn't mean that there aren't a few applicants who have received multiple awards and you know, such information is available on uh, usaspending.gov as well as other sources. All right, next question. Does a DLT applicant have to be an education healthcare provider or can a broadband provider apply? if their project will connect education or healthcare facilities with fiber broadband facilities. And I personally, I would say a broadband provider could apply, but they would also have to be the one that's providing the distance learning or telemedicine project, the uh, equipment at the, um, uh, at the end user site uh, to do the distance learning or the telemedicine. Anything else on that, Richard? No, it, it certainly is true. Uh, since the new regs were published, we clarified that um, in addition to uh, providers that we have no history with, um, our U.S. telecommunications and electric program borrowers are eligible applicants for DLT grants as well, but they have to be working with um, uh, someone who's going to be providing the services, and that's a key part of the application. I just got on our screen here that our presentation is scheduled to end in five minutes. We'll just continue to answer as questions as we can, but we might get cut off. And please feel free to reach out to us uh, through any of the methods provided earlier. Um, next question. Um, would you mind explaining about rurality scoring? I believe we've done that. If you have any additional questions on that, um, feel free to, to reach out to us. Uh, a lot of questions on eligibility. Are private universities eligible? County school systems, as Richard stated in his presentation, almost all entities are eligible, just not sole proprietorships and, um, and partnerships. My organization is a government agency. However, 28 school districts supported by our agency has agreed to participate. We will be the host site. Do we apply as a government agency or informal consortium? It sort of sounds like it could be both and. Um, and uh, um, you might self-identify as an informal consortium, but as long as the uh, entity that was asking the question is going to receive the grant and then the equipment can just be deployed in, in all of the described sites, that's going to be perfectly fine, very easy from an administrative standpoint. You'll just let us know that there's an informal consortium and that's 
it doesn't need to go any further. It's a pretty simple arrangement. All right. Is the cost of the monthly internet service for the grantor eligible? I would say no, that's an administration administrative fee. Um, we can't rec uh, pay for recurring charges, so that would not be an eligible uh, grant funded cost or match. Mm -hmm. Can adding a tower to the side of the building qualify equipment and installation? Well, sometimes towers are something that is proposed. Typically, it's related to broadband facilities, and uh, so that could be part of a proposal, but that is going to require some level of environmental review. All right. Next question. Can consultants who take on the assignment of shepherding an application be paid from an award? No, because it's it's clearly laid out in um, ineligible grant purposes. The cost of preparing an application cannot be funded, and it's also uh, in, in terms of uh, the federal grant law, uh, uh, a vendor who is involved in the preparation of the application cannot be a contractor getting any funds uh, from the grant itself. Another common question that we receive regularly, do the salaries of the university technicians who will install the equipment count as a matching contribution? The answer to that is no. Um, matching funds are the same as grant funds and for consideration, and um, uh, salaries and administrative expenses are not eligible under this, under this program. Sean, it looks like it's 329, so maybe we ought to just uh, pick people very well because uh, we're gonna get cut off. Yes. So I'm sorry, we've run out of time here. Again, uh, feel free to post any question to us. Thank you for attending this presentation. Um, and we wish you good luck on applying for this, this opportunity.